Hi, everybody. This is Greg Vandy, the director of the RAR West Art Museum. And uh, we're, we're thrilled to be hosting a wonderful exhibit at the RAR West all summer long. Uh, long Time Passing, which is a collaboration between two Wisconsin-based artists who uh, feature in artwork that is inspired by and uh, is really an honor to our agricultural history here in the state of Wisconsin. We have one of those artists with us this evening, Lorraine Ortner Blake, who uh, has contributed a great deal to this exhibit and to uh, the arts here in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, I'll do a little bit of cheating by reading off a little bit of her CV. Uh, she is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin in Madison with a Bachelor of Science degree in art education. Uh, she is a calligrapher, a painter, and a graphic artist, an illustrator, uh, and uh, her affiliations include uh, the Wisconsin Alliance of Artists and Craftspeople, Wisconsin Calligraphers Guild, uh, and also she's the founder and coordinator of Art Inspires Us, a group of painters, fiber artists, glass workers, art teachers, jewelers, and potters who meet quarterly to inspire, network, and challenge one another. Uh, we're very fortunate to have this exhibit, and uh, I invite you. Our doors are open here at the RAR West Art Museum. We're open for our regular hours. So if you get a chance over the next uh, month, month and a half, to check out this exhibit, I wholeheartedly invite you to. It will probably stir up uh, memories of farm life for you, and that kind of gets me into uh, the main introduction of Lorraine because uh, she, in her artwork, is inspired by her own memories. Uh, I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention that a lot of this collection is featured in her new book, We Always Had Chickens, Paintings and Memories, which will dovetail nicely with what Lorraine is here to talk about. If you have any questions during uh, Elaine, uh, uh, Lorraine's talk, make sure that you, uh, you, you comment in the Facebook page and uh, we'll be sure to answer them after the talk. And with that, I turn it over to a wonderful artist, illustrator, calligrapher, and uh, a wonderful person, uh, Lorraine Ortner. Well, thank Lorraine. you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. I'm going to um, bring to you my, my presentation. I'm going to just do a moment of setting up my file so you can see my screen here. And then I can start my presentation. Oh, I'm okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm glitching. No. Nope. Ah, got her. Took me a moment, but I got the technology. All right. I'm going to talk to you today about those paintings that Greg introduced. I'm so glad you're here to, to hear about it. Um, this is a, a series of paintings that was inspired by my mom. And I'm so thrilled to be able to share them with you. I've been working on these paintings about my mom's memories and my own memories for a few years. And I found that there were really four things that came together to make this project, to make these paintings happen. Um, I'm going to tell you about those impulses. Um, for one thing, my mother is almost 90, and her memories are changing. Sometimes the memories of her childhood are stronger than her memories of more recent times. And to me, that made them even more precious. Um, she had a Depression-era girlhood on an Iowa farm, and she continued her farm life through marriage and through her entire life you know, on a Wisconsin dairy farm. Um, I found in hearing her stories that her stories are both unique, but they're universal. We all have those experiences of our first independence, walking to school alone, falling in love. But we all have them in a unique sort of way. Um, my mother's experience of getting married, for example, was to receive as a gift 400 baby chicks and a pair of horses. It's not typical gifts anymore these days. A second impulse that really made this show, these paintings happen for me, was more contact with my siblings. 
typically I would see them a few times a year, some more. Um, but we started weekly Zoom calls and this led to a lot of reminiscing. A third factor that really made me keep at the drawing board was my dear friend, Roberta, who's also showing paintings at Brower West right now. She encouraged me, she made me feel like these paintings were important. Um, if you're a creative person, you probably know that need to feel like what you're making matters. And Roberta gave me that feeling. She uh, was interested in each painting and each memory. And the fourth reason that really made this happen was finding that as I age, I began to see my mother differently. As I could remember her as a 50 year old, a 60 year old, and now finding myself being 50 years old or 60 years old, there was more of a connection, more of an understanding of the, the woman she was and the girl she was. So as I out age myself every day and I live those ages that I remember seeing my mother live, it, it changed my perspective and it made me value her memories even more. So with these four motivations, how could I not paint? So right now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about my perspective when I approach painting. Um, have, have you ever been in a place that you, you can almost feel the people or the animals or the events that happened there before you? There, there are these special places that seem to feel more connected with the past. And this is my home, but sometimes when I sit out there on that front porch, I think of the other people who've lived in this house, of them sitting out on that front porch, and I feel more connected with the past. I'm, I'm not sure um, if, if there's some kind of time space continuum that, that they and I are both still there. Um, whether it's true or not, many of our experiences are shared. And as I understand, for example, Einstein's theory of relativity, which I don't, um, space and time are a single concept. You can't have one without the other. So I'm not sure quite what that means, but I can be fanciful with it when I paint. If, for example, you walked into an old, the, the schoolroom you were in when you were in first grade and nothing had changed, you might have this sense that Time had collapsed. I heard on a, a radio show recently, on the show Away With Words, perhaps you listened to that one, the phrase thin spaces. And they described it as when the distance between heaven and earth collapses and we're able to catch glimpses of the transcendent. I would add that there are places that seem to collapse the distance between the past and the present. So this feeling of thin spaces is what happens when I hear my mom's stories. When I listen, I can see the girl that she was, the young wife, the, the new mother. It's all there. We're still all these things from our past. We still have many parts to ourselves. So now I can learn the, some of these details of her life, a life that spanned a reshaping of American culture. She was born in 1931. The changes in our culture in the technology and in agriculture are huge and she's seen them all. So I feel this meditative quality of moving into that place that lives in memory. And when I hear her memories, I'm inspired to make paintings. 
So I have to tell you about that one. That's a photograph my brother-in-law took of us actually plucking chickens one day. I'm the second from the left, in case you're wondering. <laughs> so now a little bit about my evolution as an artist, how I came to paint the way I do. Um, and on this one, I've circled my face. You can see where I fit in. My mother has 14 children. At this point, there were only 12. So for a long time, I was a professional calligrapher. I sold paintings and or, um, greeting cards at art fairs all around the Midwest. And it was a wonderful career. It was very motivating. My skills developed. There's nothing more motivating than meeting the people who enjoy your work. But eventually, I went into graphic design and stopped the art fairs. And during that time, I painted for myself, I quilted, and I worked my job. But like for so many of us, as we age, things change. And I had some health issues that were really slow to resolve, and they made me feel really down. So I looked for something to to support me. I needed to think about pleasant things and things I could relive in memory at the time. And this was the first painting I did in this series. It was my oldest sister's wedding from 1974. And I heard a poet say that art can tune you up. It was an Irish poet named Michael Longley. He said, it's like taking out an old violin and tuning it up. He said that good art can make people more human and make them more intelligent, make them more sensitive. Well, painting this painting tuned me up. There's the actual farm. Everything in this painting was meaningful to me the memories of picking rocks from a newly cleared field. The neighbor's farm where I was allowed to ride my bike all alone to a bridge a half mile from home. And the wedding itself, all in one day, the bike ride, the rocks, the wedding, on a spring day, the bridemaids, all in pastel colors. I was about 12 and they just seemed so romantic. There was even Booby the milkman playing his accordion for the reception. We, we had polkas and I danced with a farm boy. The, the banner that was at the church was made by my sister and it's still used by the church. Those stained glass windows, they no, no longer exist, but I remember the light shining through them and it made everything so mystical and beautiful. So this painting was something that really gave me gave me that tuning up and so i began to explore other memories um i was reading a little of john ruskin who was a, a famous um crit critic of art and a painter himself and and he said that art can give not the actual facts but the impression they made in one's mind and so that's what i did the impression of being in a lake the impression I was left with after my husband had a heart attack, or that feeling of being in a sea of green when I was pulling mustard as a girl, cleaning the oats fields. So what started as a sort of therapy for me became a connection to my past and to my family and strongly to my mom. And I found that sharing my stories and sharing her stories gave me more connections. So that's how the paintings came to be. And they continue. This one is about making rag rugs. There were, as I mentioned before, 14 kids in the family. So as you can imagine, we had hand-me-downs and hand-me-downs and hand-me-downs. But eventually those things were no longer even fit for barn clothes, and they were ripped into strips, the buttons removed, the zippers cut out, 
and wound into balls to send to a neighbor who made beautiful rag rugs for our kitchen floor. So now I'm going to talk about the nuts and bolts of how I paint. How do I actually go about making a painting? Well, this is my mom and that's how I start. I talk to her, I ask her questions. These are some notes I made when she talked about playing baseball with her brothers when she was a little girl. And other notes for other paintings. They're simple notes, quick sketches, words. And eventually I'd start looking at old photographs. What was she wearing? What did that building look like? And then I would start with my paint box. I use gouache. Gouache is, gouache is an awkward word. It's a sort of watercolor. It's an opaque watercolor. It has larger particles in it, so it, the colors can layer up nicely. And then I use my imagination to make paintings. This is the kitchen table. This is my oldest sister, now waiting for delivery of her first child a little nervous sitting with mom, and I happily, quietly, I'm hidden down in the lower left corner. I happen to be home from school that day, recovering from my um, appendicitis, and I got to listen to them talk about delivery. It was so exciting. I showed this to my sister and she said, oh, but we were playing cards. So I had to add, the cards on the table too. The eggs are there because we truly did always have chickens. And you'll see there are 14 eggs in those cartons to represent mom's 14 children. So what started as just paintings for my own tuning up, for my own pleasure, became a book because as I shared these stories with my siblings, they had things to add. They had the memories. And I, and um, my mother had written some things. And my sister, I have a sister who's a, a really skilled writer. She wrote a lot for this book. And it became a treasure for our family. I hope you enjoy it too. Um, I put photographs with the book as well, just to give you more context. So I hope I've inspired you to consider looking back into your memories to perhaps create something. There's a lot of different venues, different opportunities. Quilting is one that I enjoy as a way of bringing together memories of old fabrics. Um, I learned in my work with memory that it's important to jot down a memory as soon as it comes to you. If you can jot it down, you might find that there are more memories ready to follow. And I learned that if there's something that comes to you and you don't really want to think about it, you can lock it away, put it in a room, lock the door, a mental room, put it in a box, hide it away. So as you're thinking about your own memories, there are different ways to inspire more information. You can use cues like the spatial area, the visual area. You can consider the sounds. Certainly when I hear a cow mooing, it brings back many memories. And emotion is a strong trigger of many emotion or of many memories. I was surprised to learn how important touch is for inspiring memories. I learned that our hands learn the feel of things without us even paying attention. And we all know how important smell is for inspiring recall. So I learned that in my, in my research about memory that um, researchers found that a familiar location help people experience more vivid and personal memories. So if you thought about the space first, perhaps thought about the house you grew up in or the schoolyard you played in and just 
populate that with a swing set and baseball diamond, that other memories might be more likely to come to you. So starting with a space is a helpful um, way to start learn, or remembering more. Well, I mentioned the cows mooing. Sound is, of course, very important for memory. A, a, a strong memory for me is of mom clinking the coal down in the furnace on winter mornings before I was out of bed. And just knowing she was getting that coal heated up again made me feel warmer. As I mentioned, emotions are very important inspirer of memory. And many childhood memories are connected with animals. So that's a direction that you might want to pursue. But there are a lot of emotions that can inspire us. The love of our first car, maturing into an adult, getting gifts of money or falling in love. They all can inspire beautiful memories. And of course, touch. There are so many things that our hands know, or in this case, ice cream, our tongue might know. That sense of touch can really bring back memories. And smell. Smell is famous for being an inspirer of memory. We, we, um, the scientists, what I read was, the scientists thought that the close physical connection between the regions of the brain of memory, emotion, and smell is why smell can bring back memories so easily. And here's a little fun fact. Did you know that smell is the only fully developed sense in a fetus and is the strongest sense until age 10? I found that fascinating. So if you use all these senses to remember, you'll find there are details in your mind that you didn't know were there. So if you are pursuing creating something from your memories, the next step might be research looking at old photos, perhaps going back to the places where things happened, and certainly talking with other people who've been there. Mm. Stories and memories have been used in art forever. I think it's an important way of sharing our lives, sharing our stories, and increasing our well-being. I hope that you will find that your memories can bring you joy, can give you a way to connect with other people. And I thank you so much for listening to my presentation tonight. Thank you, Lorraine. That was wonderful. And hello, everyone. I'm Diana. I work here at the Raw West. Um, if you have any questions and you're on Facebook or YouTube, you can put them in the comments and we'll be able to see them. And I can relay those to Lorraine. Um, I loved what you said about triggers. Um, it made me think about, um, I always feel like I can't remember a lot from when I was younger, but um, I started thinking about the schoolyard and I could trace the way home and to the sitter's house and where we used to go sledding and everything. So that's wonderful. I'm going to use that as a tool for sure. Yeah. It's an amazing ability we have. We continue to ask ourselves for more information. It's surprising what's in there. Oh, Roberta says, wonderful. She's been here all the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Roberta is a fabulous artist and a great inspirer. She gave me a sense of value as I continued this journey of painting. And you two are working on some more series together, aren't you? We are. We are. I, I'm still enjoying making some farm paintings, but I know Roberta has made progress in some new directions recently. If anyone has any questions, again, feel free to enter them. Um, we don't have anything right now. I have a painting on my drawing board that is not at the show yet but I'd love to just hold it up in the camera. Don't know how well it will show, but I'm gonna I'd get- I'd love it. to see it. It's just about finished. 
But I had the sketch in my PowerPoint presentation of my mom playing baseball with her brothers. Let's see how I can do this. It's a little tiny, I realize, but eventually I got my mother running about playing baseball with her brothers. There she is. <laughs> I love that. Do you want to talk a little bit about gouache? Oh, yeah. Gouache is a wonderful medium. You can use it a little like oils if you wish. You can mix in some acrylic medium so that it becomes, you know, firm, solid. Um, or you can treat it like watercolor and may have very thin, fine layers of color. I think an advantage as an illustrator is that it allows you to, to do both to put those very fine, fine details, which are hard to get with oil paint, but it also allows you to build up thick color and interesting layers of colors. I really love the like matte texture of it, how it's not shiny. Yeah. Um, I think it, it, you're right with the details really just come out when you do that. Yeah. And Greg's gonna join us here. Great. Greg, do you have any questions for Lorraine? Here I am. Hi, Greg. Well, yes, I think I do. First of all, thank you so much. I, it was, uh, your, your talk was so lyrical. It was like poetry. And I, I don't know whether before I got on uh, that, Diana, whether you talked at all about the Spark program that we've had for years here at the RAR West, which is um, a program that was... Uh, developed uh, first out in New York, and, and it's uh, really caught on very well within our state and in uh, Minnesota, which is, um, it is uh, an art therapy or a museum therapy for people with early stage memory loss. And a lot of the things, you, when you talked about the tactile connecting to memory is something that we've talked about at Spark and a lot of our Spark programming specifically works with tactile or auditory or uh, olfactory memory. And so uh, getting all of the senses involved. So that hit upon me and I, I got to figure, boy, when it comes to agriculture, you were talking about what, how strong smells bring, draw memory. Oh. Uh, is that there are such distinctive smells and I'm, everybody probably laughs when I think of distinctive smells on a farm, there are some that really are overpowering. But uh, I'm, you know, I it strikes me that it doesn't take much in this community if you're driving around to get that hint of smell in certain time periods that can draw you back into memories of, of working and living on a farm. That's so true. You know, the smell of the dry corn in the fall blowing in the wind or the freshly cut hay, all of that can just take you back. Uh, I have to tell you earlier today, my, hey, husband, my husband brought in a wheel, a wheel from a wagon to make me smell it because it smells a little bit of my dad because he was working with machines, he was working with oil. And so I had to smell that wheel. <laughs> it was really kind of interesting. <laughs> I believe it. And um, you talked a little bit about your family and how the project that you've worked on has allowed you to connect, especially during COVID when you really couldn't connect. Uh, you come as many people from, um, as many people who grew up on farms from a rather large family. Um, do you talk at all in your book, for instance, about like that aspect? And can you give us a little bit of uh, like where everybody is now and uh, do many members of your family still have agricultural connections or have people gone in all different sorts of ways? That's a really good question. I still have two brothers who are working the, the home farm. This has been their lifelong career. Um, they have grown sons who are working the farm with them. And those sons have young sons and daughters who are interested in farming. So that has continued through the generations. Many of my siblings went into either teaching or some sort of caring profession, medical profession. Um, 
I think farming farming is a really terrific way to make a living, but you have to, it's a, it's a hard way. It's physically demanding, but it suits my two brothers. Well, they love it. They have great skills. Um, they're, they can fix the tractor, they can milk the cow and they can en enjoy being out in nature every day. I also, I, it struck me that you had uh, thrown out uh, John Ruskin's name. And I have actually in my office have a John Ruskin quote, uh, the life so long, the craft so hard, uh, so long, or the, the life so long, the craft so hard to learn. And that gets to my next question. And it, it's something you just mentioned. When we talk about farm life and, and disappearing farms, there is the aspect of a lot of people not wanting to farm. And there are in certain areas and certainly within uh, communities here in Wisconsin, young people who are interested either in continuing farm life or people that maybe have a romantic notion, but something that leads them to become like first generation farmers. Yeah. Um, but it is, a, it is a difficult way to make a living. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about like uh, uh, kind of the modern farm life and how you would envision it it becoming like it's sustaining itself. Whew, that that might be more than I can compass. But as I see my brothers as farmers, to me the contemporary farmer is spending a lot of time with machines. Um, that what, what was standing out on a flat rack and moving bales of hay no longer exists, at least for, on their farm. Um, what was um, pushing around carts of silage in front of rows of cows is now machines moving feed into bunkers from bunkers. So it's, it's a different, different kind of industry than it was in the 60s, 70s, 80s when I was there. Um, and so it requires skills. It requires skills that uh, like mechanical skills, electronic skills. I'm, I'm very proud of my brothers. They've got, a, they, can, they can build huge sheds. They can butcher a cow. They can fix whatever needs fixing. Uh, so that's this wide range of skills that uh, takes, maybe like you said with, with Ruskin, it can take a lifetime to learn them all. And they're, sharing them with their sons and their grandchildren. I don't know what, what to think of for the future. Uh, I, I would imagine it will just continue to become more machine-based because it is a very heavy labor kind of industry. That makes sense to me. I, I would figure the same. Yeah, yeah. Diana, yeah. do you have any other questions? No, I was just thinking that we should continue that train of thought when we um, have Roberta here to talk on the 19th, because a lot of her work is addressing those changes. That's yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Lorraine, for coming, and thanks to you and to Roberta. Now, uh, Roberta will be speaking here in person on June 19th, and uh, so we'll have another program there. Uh, we have a number of other programs. Diana, you wanted to speak to those? Um, just that Lorraine will also be uh, presenting that day as well, and there'll be a book signing. That's right. Thank you. And we do have some uh, books and other things in our uh, museum gift shop. So if you come to the museum to check out the exhibit, make sure you check out the Roar West, uh, the shop at the Roar uh, that has uh, a few different things from both of the artists. And uh, make sure, make sure that you check out this exhibit. Even if you didn't grow up uh, with farms all around you, uh, it is a great connecting point to our agricultural heritage and our current agriculture here in uh, the state of Wisconsin, and certainly in northeastern Wisconsin here in the surrounding area of Manitowoc. Thanks again, Lorraine. Thank you to uh, all the people, all of our viewers. And uh, we'll make sure to see you again very, very soon. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. This has been a real privilege.